when he w when George Bush was sworn in as president, it was about noon. By five o'clock that afternoon, every Ronald Reagan appointee had been fired. Remember, he's the guy who called supply side economics, which saved us voodoo economics. Well, they couldn't fire me because I was had civil service protection and I was just a prosecutor, you know, catching bank robbers, and they don't care about that. It's no threat. No threat to a big government agenda, at least. And that is kind of what's continuing now. We have a cause. They do not. They resort to dirty tricks because they have nothing to convince people to support them for. They have no issues. They have no problems. So it's, well, it's all personal with them. The only way to get people to vote for them is to trash the other guy. And that's what they do. And that's what they've been doing. It's, it's crazy. Uh, they, they do so much of it. Um, I'm, I'm, this is my initial foray into politics. And um, I'm learning that the truth is used to misrepresent. Like if you have um, uh, Matt Lynch and he votes for a bill which reduces taxes for everyone by about $5,000 but increases a tiny tax by two cents a year, they'll say, he's a tax hiker. And people don't know. They don't follow politics closely enough. But also, things are so complex, you can't. I mean, we're, we're, we're in a sad state right now. We have a president who passes laws with a stroke of a pen. We have bureaucracies that crank out 100,000 regulations a month. If you look at the Code of Federal Regulations, it would fill this room and more. Companies have to hire people to just try to keep abreast of what they're supposed to be doing. These rules conflict at times, they overlap at times, it's crazy. And they're used for almost nothing. When people fill out applications or say what they're, they're doing, they rely on people to just tell the truth. So you and I will report the truth, and we have to cope with the burdens of the law. Crooks don't. They don't. And they say they do. And they're not caught unless it becomes utterly outrageous. And at that point, the FBI gets involved. They bring it to someone like I who used to be a prosecutor, and they say, oh, we've got a case. And they're all really big. They're multi-million dollar cases. Because all the other ones are just like, you get away with it. It's, it's, it's hard. Um, right to life, okay? Planned Parenthood was originally founded by Margaret Sanger to destroy the black race in America. That's what its objective was. And it's continued that proud tradition now uh, of what it's doing today. Um, I, Congress, Congressman Joyce, i got to tell you something about him. There was a bill, a right to life bill, uh, in Congress, Congress pending, and it languished for about six or seven months. And Dave Joyce did not sign on to co sponsor it. Then Chuck Laughlin took petitions out to run for Congress, and he signed on as a co sponsor the next day. That's the kind of commitment you can expect out of him. Governor Kasich, it was interesting. We had a, uh, a meeting at the Yoga Tea Party, and um, Sarah LaTourette said that a bill has been passed, the right to life bill, the heartbeat bill, which now isn't any good because the Supreme Court knocked it down in another state. But <clears throat> a version passed in the House, a version passed in the Senate, and they were going to have to be reconciled. And I, I asked from the audience, well, what's the governor going to do? And she said, oh, he'll sign it because a lot of Democrats support it. And I said, you know, President Kennedy had profiles in courage. For our governor, we should have profiles in cowardice. <laughs> this is a, a fight for the soul of the party. Um, and I don't know how I'm going to fit into it, but I'm going to do what I can. Um, we had an event at uh, Kent State Geauga Campus uh, a few nights ago. And I, would, I prayed for guidance, I said, you know, because I had a, I had a little thing prepared, but it didn't seem like it was going to be very well received, and I just said, you know, guide me. And I sat there, and I heard these people portraying, like, Amy Sabbath, and David Joyce, and Scott Kayser as true conservatives. And I just, I got tense, and I got angrier, and angrier, and angrier. So when it came to be my turn, I just basically said, this is, this is the kind of stuff that we have to cut through. It's not legitimate. And 
I don't remember exactly what I said when I was done. I, um, oh, yes. I, well, I, I told my wife, I said, I think I blew it. She wasn't there. I said, because I got angry. And since, since I found out that someone heard me there, and the young guy, and he was not one of us, but he was so impressed, he got our cards and was passing them out to friends at a fish frog. And, I, and my wife said, you know, there's so much anger at the establishment, maybe you tapped into it. Maybe it was a little thing that you, you know, lost your pool. And I think we're seeing a shift, a monumental shift. I think that Obama by, you know, we used to have what was called creeping socialism. Well, he was like galloping socialism or rocket sled socialism, like boom. Um, and it woke people up. It got me off my rear end and, and helping to form a tea party. And it got a lot of us active because we saw for once clearly the result. And it's not like, you know, well, you're increasing this tax by you know, two cents this year and then two years from now, five cents. All of a sudden it's like kaboom, $5,000 a year. And you go, what? And you look and you think and you react and you see how bad it is. So I think, strangely as this is, for all the harm Obama's done, and God knows he's done a ton of it, maybe it's part of God's plan that he was going to wake us up and now the pendulum will come back the other way. And I think we're seeing that at the presidential level. The outsider vote in both parties is gigantic. People are realizing that establishment politicians will say or do anything to get elected and then forget all their promises and do whatever they want, which is the safest route for them to keep their, their seat. That's all they do. That's all they ever do. My wife told me this, and at first I didn't believe it, but I'm coming around to believe it. The, there is really only one establishment and they're liberal, and they're in both parties. And I, I, someone came up to me and said that uh, Kasich confided in, in this guy. He wished he was a Democrat when he first ran. La Tourette was a Democrat before he first ran as a Republican. Um, and it's like, they just, I, it's, it's, it's big government, it's self-aggrandizing, and it's making money off taxpayers. I think one of the biggest businesses in the United States right now is overtaxing and blowing the money on stupid things but making sure you get some in your wallet and profit by it. That's what Amy Sabbath is doing as a consultant. Um, and that's what Kayser will undoubtedly do and that's what Lacourette did. Uh, and it's an interesting story about Steve. I've known Steve for a long time. I, he was a, a defender, a, a state defender when I was a state prosecutor. And we argued cases against each other in the Ohio Supreme Court. <clears throat> He's dying now because of bureaucracy, because of all the problems he would voice on us. He gets free medical care at the um, uh, some big uh, center, but they keep rotating doctors. Someone noticed something that should have been followed up on, and that page wasn't included in the other records. And it turned out it was, it was cancerous, it was in his pancreas, and it wasn't followed up. So he got pancreatic cancer. Now that's the kind of thing he would voice on us. When the government does anything, you know, three things. It's going to be done inefficiently, it's going to be much too costly, and it's going to be implemented corruptly. You get donations, you get a waiver. But all the other guys in your industry get crushed by rules that are just preposterous. Like some of these, these farm rules, the guy who, who, who confronted Obama last time he was running said, I don't want to have to sit around for six hours filling out forms. I've got a field to plow. Well, that's what they make us do. They have, I mean, it's, 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 it, the, 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 the genesis of the bill, I thought, is kind of like this. They stand up, Obama stands up and says, you know, we've got a national problem. There's tooth decay. We lose, and you make up the number and you're never challenged. 400 million hours of work, productive work due to tooth decay. And we need to provide toothbrushes and toothpaste for people for free. And so then you start a program to do that. And people say, oh, I'm getting it for free. I have to pay $7 for a toothbrush. Well, your taxes have to pay $14 because it goes to Washington, it goes through layers of bureaucrats, all making $100,000 a year or more just pushing papers, some of them with only high school degrees, I've seen it, there are a lot of them in the office I was in, 
and it, and it comes back. And it comes back, and their approach to try to micromanage over 300 million people, which you can't do. So if they have you know, one size fits all, and you get this toothpaste. Well, suppose you're allergic to something in it, and it makes your gums bleed or something like that. Well, then you, you have to lobby, and they have to put an exception, okay? And then and, and, and you have to go to, to apply for it. You have to go through, fill out some cumbersome application, and they have to have an appeals process, and they have to determine whether you get it. And after like, okay, after like a year, you get it or you don't get it. They want to run our, more and more of our lives through this mechanism. It's hard. It's ridiculous. And, it, and it's, 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 it's not fair. My, uh, basically, there, there is a way out, and it, it's very clear that it's not even open to question. Is the path Ronald Reagan took. We had these problems with Jimmy Carter. Humiliation abroad, no one respected us. The economy was going completely crazy. All kinds of problems. And in eight years, we had a roaring economy. Communism fell, and we were respected in the world. We can do that again, but we have to do we take the path that Ronald Reagan took, and that's what I believe. Um, I came in as a Reagan Republican. I'm going to go out as a Reagan Republican. Thank you. I think maybe Pastor Ernie thought you were going to go on for a few minutes. Um, so I guess I'm a big guy who needs no introduction, and if they don't, they don't give an introduction. Um, my name is Coach Dave Dobbin. My, my wife and I were down from around Columbus, Ohio, and uh, we've been involved in this uh, battle for, as Superman would say, truth, justice, and the American way ever since I got sued uh, for, as a football coach in 1997 for having prayer for the football teams at London High School. And when uh, we went through that lawsuit with the ACLU, didn't, I didn't lose my job after uh, two years of fighting those dogs. We laid down our, our, our coaching career and we started to pass the salt ministry. Matthew chapter 5 verse 13 says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its savor, it is henceforth good for nothing said to be cast out and trodden by the foot of men. Now, as I look back over my, my uh, ministry years, maybe I'd have been better if I had come up with a different name because when I began to accuse the church of being good for nothing, which was Jesus' words, Denver, not mine. Jesus said that, right? The reality of it is, we see now, 15, 16 years later, however long it's been, the effects of a good for nothing, watered down gospel, a non-confrontational, everybody roll over and take it gospel. I'm not mad, although I love you. But uh, for the first time in, uh, in our ministry life, of, as I said, since we quit teaching and coaching in, in 2000, so what is this, 2016, since we've been doing this, I've never seen a time like we see in America today. I've, been, I've spent a lot of time, not as much as Pastor Ernie, out at the abortion clinics, out at the gay pride parades, out in the public square trying to make, make Christian values become important. And I have to tell you, it's been very, very frustrating. Can I say men in here? That's what I'm talking about. Seems like the harder we work, the more we do, the less ground we make. But uh, my football coaching tells me that you play to the end. In fact, the scripture says that he who endures to the end shall be saved, right? Yeah, okay. Occupy till I return. Right? doesn't say that anybody's going to like it. That's why we're past the salt, not past the sugar. Right? We're, we're not the sugar of the earth. We're the soul of the earth. Yeah. And for too long, the church is trying to be loved, liked, sweet, rather than truthful. Just stand for the truth and speak the truth. No matter what happens, let, be accountable for that. Right? That's, that's what we've tried to do. But I'm really excited because I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story. Um, 
Y'all know the Kim Davis story, right? Oh, yeah. Kim Davis, the girl down in Kentucky, the, we all know that story. Well, I'm going to give you the behind the scenes story because we, we, were, we were there. We made the Kim Davis story happen that most people don't know about. But it happened in my life because, let's go back to the other slide, brother, if we can. How many of you ever heard of the doctrine of lesser magistrates? It's sweeping the nation. If y'all all get a pen and write this down, because when you go to get home, you're going to wish you had. And you, go, if you need to share this with everybody you know. It's a very simple website. Defy Tyrants. DefyTyrants.com. DefyTyrants.com. And it's going to send you to this website here. Uh, put together by Pastor Matt Tuella up in, around Milwaukee. Matt's become a good friend of mine. Pastor, as you know, he's one of us. Hey, he's, he's a rescuer. He's a guy that's been out on the streets trying to save the unborn babies. Him and his family stayed with me a couple of years ago. He, just had, he has 12 kids and just had a 13th grandchild. So he's one of us. This is not some policy wonk. Do you understand? He went back and he did great research on our government and what's happened to our government. And he's come up with a biblical answer to the mess that we're in. And it's called the Doctrine of the Lesser Magistrates. Check on this, please. Go to his website. Hey, Defy Tyrants. That's the website. Amen. Defy Tyrants. It's easy to remember. And we're in the mess we're in today. Because we are trying our best to overcome the tyrannical arm of government, forcing law down on us that first and foremost is a law. We understand this, don't we? It's not up there. It's normally the big slogan, courts cannot make law. I'll say it again because maybe you didn't hear it. This isn't something somebody just made up. It may have a constitution with them. I usually carry one. To, I forgot my Bible in this for the, for the first time ever. When you look at Article 1, Section 1, all legislative powers, all legislative powers are vested where? Does anybody know? Hang on a minute. How much Denver? How much? How much legislative power? All. Oh, how, how much is left over for the courts when you hear all? All legislative powers vested where? In Congress. Uh, Article 1. All. All. How much left over in all? All. I ate all that cake. How much left over? Zero. Courts cannot make law. A court decision is not law. That's the whole lesser magistrate doctrine. I want to incite you. There are great things going on all across America with grassroots people who are beginning to wake up to this. I'm going to tell you the Kim Davis story, but not yet. We were down in, uh, well, let me give you an example. Because this is so hard. It's so hard for us to believe this, that all these laws we've been following aren't laws. Hey, Roe versus Wade, show me the law. Show me the law legalizing abortion. Can somebody do that? Nope. Why, why can't you show me a law? It's only good. It's not a law. What? There ain't no law. There ain't no law. How about this? Show me the law that says no prayer in school. Somebody show me that law. There ain't a law. How about no Bible reading in school? Somebody show me that one. Well, how about this one? Stone first screen in 1980. No Ten Commandments on public buildings. Can somebody show me that law? Hey, can somebody show me the law? Then why do we act like it's a law? Why do we follow it? Marijuana. Federal offense, yes or no? Anybody disagree with that? My brother was a big dope smoker. He told me when he started school, Ohio University in 1968, Marijuana possession was 30 years. Mar possession of a marijuana cigarette in 1968 was 30 years. It's a federal crime to this day. Unless you live in Colorado. Why is it not a federal crime in Colorado? No, because the people in Colorado said, not here. That law don't apply here. Constitution doesn't say anything about marijuana, and if it did say anything about marijuana, it would say it was a right of the state to make 
made that determination. There's no law. Right now today, Colorado, you can buy smoke pot. Smoke pot in Ohio, what happens to you? Huh? Right? You follow what I'm saying? So, the state of Missouri has just passed a law or has introduced a bill telling the federal government their federal gun laws don't apply in Missouri. Why? States are going to handle that. We make our own laws regarding gun rights. Right. You follow? Are you guys following this? Yeah. Anybody at this point yet started to attach in your mind marriage? Anybody attaching that yet? Right? And so all across America, people are beginning to wake up and say, why have we been following these? Why have we been following this? If all legislative power is vested where? In Congress. Isn't it amazing? Everybody's all worried about Judge Scalia not being on the Supreme Court. Well, he'll make law anyway. They offer opinions. They give interpretations of it. But when the Supreme Court makes a ruling that a man can marry a, a man, the state of Ohio will say, hey, good luck, chief. Not here. Not here. That ain't a law. How do you make a law? We know how laws are made, don't we? We know how laws are made. That way the people get to have some say in the law process. Every major moral issue in my lifetime, I'm 63, every more major moral law in our lifetime has been determined by the courts, never by the people. You let the people vote on marriage, what do they say? One man, one woman. You let the people vote on abortion, what do they say? No abortion. You let the people vote on prayer in schools, what do the people say? Permit it. You let the people vote on whether it's a Christian nation or not, and what do they say? It's a Christian nation. Every, every one of those laws have been overturned because why? I know. We believe the courts <laughs> make law. You're a special The guy. courts don't make law. I, I can't say it enough. I can't say it enough times. The courts don't make law. The courts don't make law. Yeah, Are you getting the point? Excellent. Yeah, the courts don't make the law. The courts, not only don't, they can't. <laughs> Tell that to they can't make law. Tell that to By the way, there is a law in Ohio. There's a law in Tennessee. That's where Kim Davis is from, right? Thank you, honey. Kentucky. I got Tennessee on my mind because I'm just down there, too. They called Kim Davis a lawbreaker. Because she said, I'm not going to marry a homosexual. <laughs> they called her a lawbreaker and out of jail, lose her job and everything. And she said, wait a minute. I swore an oath to uphold the Constitution of the state of Kentucky. And in the state of Kentucky, by 81%, of the people in Kentucky said marriage is between a man and a woman. I'm morally obligated to uphold that law. Hey, how about the federal law? Show me the law. And maybe I'll follow it. By the way, there was a federal law. Anybody know that? There was a federal law signed by Bill Clinton. You guys remember it? What was it called? DOMA. DOMA! Defense of Marriage Act. A federal law regarding marriage, even though they had no federal authority on it. The, the federal court, uh, I'm sorry, the federal Congress said marriage is put between a man and a woman. Yeah, and what did the homos have to do to get that overturned? Supreme Court said that's not law. Are still me from you can't make that law. So they had to tear down DOMA to enforce this made up decision that they made. So there's Kim Davis. And all she has to do is say to the judge, well, let me back up. So we understand. I just live, I live in Ohio. You guys know where I live. I live in Columbus. So Kim Davis isn't that far away from us. I don't know Kim Davis. But we think it's probably pretty going to be a pretty good fight. This might be worth showing up for. So we load up a bunch of rough, wild, crazy guys like us, and we go down to Ashland, Kentucky, where Kim Davis is going to be in, on, in trial in front of Judge David Bunny. We go down there. It's Thursday afternoon before Labor Day. And it's like you've been to a hundred of them, Pastor. You've been to a thousand of them. We're all there, and the homos are all, I, I mean, the, the, the sodomites are all there. And they're doing their, they're holding their signs. The Christians are out there. This is kind of a free-for-all in the streets. You know how they go. And all of a sudden, word comes down. And while she's in the court, 
Judge Bunning threw her in jail. Didn't charge her with anything. You guys remember the cool, remember the movie Cool Hand Luke? Yeah. Huh? Remember how they used to put Cool Hand Luke into the into the the, the hole? Yeah. Get his mind right. Well, Judge Bunny said we're gonna throw her in, in the we're gonna throw her in the slammer. Maybe she get her mind right. And you can come back next Thursday, they told her. And if you got your mind right, then maybe we'll let you out. So we're like everybody else. They go, it's awful, man. The judge, of course, you should be mean to her. And uh, my buddy Flip Benham calls me on Flip when he's in North Carolina. He calls me on the phone and says, oh, coach, you can't let that stand. You guys can't let that stand. He said, the eyes of America are watching. So there we were, about 30 of us. Thursday afternoon when they locked her up. All of us from Ohio. We hit the streets. We planted and printed up flyers. We went and stood out on the in, in the intersection and handed out flyers. We went to Friday night football games and handed out flyers at the Friday night football games. And on the flyer it says, join us at a rally Saturday morning outside the jail for Kim Davis. Come and stand up for God and stand up for Kim Davis. We handed out five. I don't know how many of them we handed out. This is Friday afternoon. We, they threw in jail Thursday. We jumped into action Thursday night. We start handing them out all day Friday. And on, on Saturday morning at 10 o'clock outside the jail, about a thousand people from Grayson, Kentucky showed up. And we began to raise heaven. Courts can't make law. We began telling all those thousand people there the same thing I'm saying to you now. We got to do something. This is abomination. Free Kim Davis. We made up signs and we put on signs. Free Kim. Show us the law or set her free. Show us the law or set her free. Wow. There's only one law that they can show. The law of the state of Kentucky, which said marriage is between a man and a woman. Kim Davis is the only law keeper in the whole bunch, right? So we have our little rally, thousand people show up. We think, what are we going to do now? It's Labor Day weekend. Everybody's going to go eat hot dogs and go to the beach. And we're going to lose all of our momentum. So I jumped on the internet and did a bunch of research. I wanted to find out where Judge David Bunning lived. <laughs> Through a series of miraculous events, we found out he lived in Fort Thomas, Kentucky. I talked to our group of 30. says, come on, we're going to go visit the judge. I called my attorney. I said, what are we allowed to do? It's federal stuff, right, Pastor Ernie? Yeah. This, is, this is serious stuff. He's not messing with a federal judge. Yeah. And I called our attorney. He said, well, Coach, listen. He said, you cannot. You can pray in the neighborhood. The courts are very clear, but you can't target his house. If you target his house, you're asking for some trouble. So as long as you guys keep moving, you can carry signs, you can do whatever you want to. By the way, we're never going to win this war if everybody's afraid to get hurt. Amen. If we're all afraid about what they might do to it, it's war. I coach football. Uh, those football guys, when they come out off the field injured, crying to me, I say, well, what'd you expect? <laughs> Those other guys are wearing helmets and shoulder pads. They're going to try to knock your teeth out. <laughs> But we think in this war, to just love everybody right there. The other side, they'll just love, be so nice to us. So I said, hey, listen, just tell our buddies we're going to go there. We've got to keep moving. Exactly what the attorney said. So we drive into Fort Thomas, Kentucky. It's about an hour and 20 minutes from, from uh, uh, down there in uh, Grayson. By the way, uh, Judge Bunny was, is the son of the great baseball pitcher. Yeah, Jim Bunny. It's his son. Jim Bunny was a Hall of Fame pitcher for the Philadelphia Phillies. So we get down there, we, we find out where it is. I'm looking at it on Google Maps and trying to figure, is this really it? Doesn't look like a judge's house. And yes, yeah, so we, we finally figure, yeah, it is. So, so we get down there, park our car, get out, and 
We're walking up the street. We're carrying out all the signs. We get up there. What I know is the judge's house. And there comes this guy dressed like, just dressed like a normal guy. No tie, nothing on. Two guys standing there. He comes walking right down to me. He says, Coach Dave, great to meet you. I'm thinking, you know, maybe this is somebody that's come to join us from somebody. I, I, mean, I don't know. And so we're walking. And as we're walking, all of a sudden it comes very obvious to me. He's a federal marshal. And he and his buddy, three buddies, are there to jump guard the judge's house. And so, uh, you know, I'm trying to explain to him, we know what's going on. He said, so he, he takes us right up in there. And he said, hey, listen, here's what it is. He says, you guys are allowed to stand here to all the way down here. He says, all we ask you to do is don't get in the yard. Don't tear up any grass. But you folks are free to stand anywhere you want to here, right in front of the judge's house. I'll come back to that. Because that ain't no way you're allowed to do that, brother. And no way that you're allowed to do that. So we're there six hours. And every satellite truck around Cincinnati, that's Kentucky and Indiana, where are they all on the day before Labor Day on a slow news day? They are out front Judge Bunning's house. At these wild and crazy folks that are out there holding these signs. And what do the signs say? You got it. Show us the law or set her free. And every time we have a chance to do an interview, and they're interviewing one of us, why don't we make sure we say, courts don't make law. Show us the law or set her free over and over and over and over and over again. Six hours we stand there. Hey, you're hearing stuff nobody in the world knows. I, I was there. 30 of us are doing this. Little kids. So we go home. By the way, Mike Huckabee tried to make some, I'm not making fun of me, tried to make some political hay out of it. They scheduled a rally there on Tuesday for Kim Davis. Mike Huckabee did 3 o'clock. So we've done our thing now at the judge's house. We're feeling just good because we got a way to get arrested. You know how that is, don't you, Pastor? They didn't get us. We're, we're safe. We get back to the hotel and we're trying to figure out well, the rallies. And tomorrow at 3 o'clock, what are we going to do? Well, we're still handing out flyers. We're still doing all that kind of stuff. And I get up in the morning and I go down into the lobby to get one of those free breakfasts like you always get at the hotel. And I'm, I'm eating and I look up there and there's, there it is. That Channel 4, is it Good Morning America? What's, channel, what's on Channel 4? What's on, what's on NBC? The Today Show. And there I am. <laughs> now, I'm not saying anything, but there I am. And they're talking about what's going on down in, in Grayson, Kentucky, and we're at the judge's house in Fort Thomas, Kentucky, and they're saying, then they play a clip about not show us the law or set her free, and they're showing us our signs and everything. We think, wow, this is unbelievable. Just 30 of us here. Just 30 of us. We are raising hell. Heaven. We're raising heaven. And so I get done eating my meal. Like the, they're going to have the, Mike Huckabee's going to have his rally down to the same little jail that we had before where they're keeping Kim Davis. So I get down at about 9 15, 9 30, a little bit early. The rally starts at 3. And I get down, get off the freeway, Grayson, Kentucky, this little podunk city out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, Kentucky Christian University's there. We're down the street. Turn light to go down, turn left to go down to the jail, 9.15 in the morning. As soon as I turned left, the street was lined with good old boys. 9.15 in the morning. You know what they're holding dinner? Set her free. <laughs> Courts cannot make law. That afternoon, over 10,000 people showed up at that rally. They said that literally getting off of the freeway, if you have to see where it was, there's a, you know how you, there's a lane to get off. The lane to get off the freeway to get to the rally was 10 miles long. We had 10,000 there and probably 10,000 more trying to get there. And all of them saying, what? Courts don't make law. Courts don't make law. They knew it. All of a sudden, you know how all of a sudden your eighth grade history comes back to you? said, yes, that's right. Courts don't make, they can't make law. And while we're there, 
1.30 in the afternoon before the rally starts at 3. I get a buzz on my phone. I can't believe it. I look at it. You know what it says? They set her free. Judge Bunning set her free. Didn't like us outside his house, I don't think. And then I put two and two together. I believe the call went out. Don't arrest any more Christians. Christians are too riled up. The Fed said they're too riled up. Don't arrest any more Christians. That's why they let us stand out in front of his house. They were trying to appease us. They thought it all would just go away. But see, here's the good news. Wow, oh, so while we're there, we get the word that they're going to let her out. There's 10,000 people. It's spreading through the crowd. You can't believe it. It was like one of the most unbelievable things, Pastor Ernie, because you know when you go to street ministry, you hardly ever get any reward. You never can see nothing, right, ever. Sometimes you get a save, sometimes a turn away. Maybe you're hoping you get something. And there we are, 10,000 people, who many of them have come out for the first time in their life to do something that they thought was important. They came out and held the signs while we're there. It was like the stone gets rolled away. And she comes walking out of that jail with 10,000 people standing. It was one of the most unbelievable things I've ever seen part of. I've ever seen. That's because of the doctrine of the lesser magistrates. DefyTyrants.com. That individual Americans and now individual state elected officials are learning. Ah, yeah. Courts don't make law. And so we're seeing what's called interposition. Eight, I'm sorry, ninth and tenth amendment. The rights not granted to the federal government belong to who? To the people and to the states. And all we are seeing is what's called interposition or nullification. The states are beginning to stand up and say, not here. Not here. But what we need is more and more elected officials with some courage who are not afraid of that federal beast. So we're down in Tennessee, Nashville, a couple weeks ago, because the national representative, this stuff's all on this website. Hey, that's your homework. If you do that, you're going to be so much more informed, I can't even tell you. Representative Mark Pody down in Nashville, Tennessee, introduced a bill saying, what? Go pound sand. The Oberfeld decision has no power over us here. Try and get it into into the House, and of course they buried it in the committee, wouldn't let it out of the committee, because heaven forbid the Republicans would have to stand up and do what was right or take a position. And the word around the State House was very clear. If it made it to the floor, it would be almost unanimous. Nobody would vote against it. It was an 82 to 18 vote in, in, the, in the election. Marriage is between a man and They know that down in Tennessee. They got 18, they chew tobacco. They understand that, right? <laughs> So there is the place to do it. But they buried it in committee. And the Republicans hated Mark Pody. How dare you put, put us in that position? How dare you bring that up? And right now, today, today's Saturday, the Congress in Tennessee is getting ready to perform a rare moment where it's going to be brought to the floor of the House, and they will vote as to whether or not that bill gets out of committee or not. They were overriding the rules of the subcommittee, which wanted to kill the bill, and there's enough support down there that they want to bring it to the floor without the approval of the committee. And you can imagine the Republican leadership is livid. Discharge petition. They're livid. Listen, I learned this. Yes, brother. Go ahead. Are any other legislators looking at them to do the same thing in other states like Ohio. It's happening in Oklahoma. It's happening in Texas. It's happening in North Carolina. It's happening in Kansas. It's happening. We just need one. Once that happens and people begin to understand that this tyrant is, if they can, if they can reclaim our power to the states, who cares what Scalia says? Well, now, to a point, right? <laughs> but right now, that's where that every moral decision is coming from there. It's all coming from there against the will of the people. So this doctrine of interposition is gaining strength. And I tell, tell everywhere I go that this is 1973 all over again. 
Roe versus Wade. This is Obergefell. This is Roe versus Wade. And had Christians pushed back in 1973, how many babies would be alive today, Pastor? Well, actually, it's over 100 million. Over 100 million. If we had pushed back then. Instead right. of giving them 40 years to get it entrenched and then try to do all the legislation we can to get it undone when the truth of the matter is it didn't a stinking law to begin with. Right. But the pastors had, they had the, the positions, the pastors had the authority, the pastors had the responsibility in 62 and in 73 to stand up and yet they failed God. Amen. They failed God, they failed the country, they failed each other. So here we are in 2016, and the pastors have the chance to do it again. You're right. Instead, I'm going to step on some toes. Is it okay? You got your hard shoes on, and I'll be going. You can soak your feet when you get home. I'm not for this Pastor Protection Act. I'm not for it. I hope they throw some of them in jail. Huh? I hope they throw some of them in jail. They're going to protect a pastor, but not protect a baker? Not going to protect just the, the regular guy who goes to jail? They're going to protect the pastors? No! Let the pastor stand up and say to Caesar, No! No! Because the law is already on our side. If Kim Davis could have sat down before a judge and said, Your Honor, I will follow the law. Show me the law. What law would they have had to show her? The only one there, the law of the state of Kentucky, she was following the law. And Pastor Ernie, a very great dynamic happened. We were having those four days down there where we were trying to get everything organized. We were getting a little bit of pushback from the church. The church didn't want to support us. You know why? Romans 13, we'd be, we'd, be, oh, we'd be sinning if we didn't do what the government said. But when we were able to open their eyes that the courts are tyrannical, the courts are breaking the law, not the people, it took the pressure off of them. Now they could support Kim Davis because she was, in fact, upholding the law, by the way, God's law, right? Now, Kim made, a, Kim made a mistake. God bless her because she had more courage than most guys. But she made a mistake. Her lawyers told her that this was about religious liberty. Wrong fight. We'll lose that fight every time. The homosexuals have religious liberty. Atheists have religious liberty. Everybody has religious liberty. The argument is, number one, Courts cannot make law. That's the number one argument. They can't make law. That law does not, is not valid on the people in Ohio. That's number one. And number two, even if it was, it violates, violates the law of God. And we say no to it. That, that, that's the two issues. So at some point, this thing is going to come to a head. Obergefell is not going, by the way, it's not the law of the land. No matter how much Sean Hannity tells you it is, and Bill O'Reilly, even though he's looking out for you, he's, that's, that's a lie. It's a, it's a doctrine of what they call judicial supremacy. That when they make a court decision, that's it. You know that, uh, 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 get my, get my mind working here. Dred Scott! The Dred Scott decision was never overturned. On the books today. It is ignored. They just ignore it. So, well, Supreme Court, we sure appreciate your opinion, but go pound sand. It don't affect us here. And folks, that's where it is. Think about this a minute. Think about the implications of this. 1947, Everson versus the Board of Education, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that dastardly law separation between the church and state. Nowhere, and in, in fact, the Constitution says just the opposite. It says just the opposite. Congress shall make no law regarding the establishment of religion. So we believe that in 1947. And based on that judicial supremacy and stare decisis, right? Previously decided decision, case law, separation of church and state, 1960, took prayer out of school based on that. 1963, took Bible reading out of school based on that. 1980, they took the Ten Commandments. 1973, they abortion based on that. 1980, they took the Ten Commandments off the wall based on that lie and separation between the church and state. 2002, Lawrence v. Texas, they legalized homosexual sodomy for the first time in 6,000 years based on that. And now, 
They tell us the main canary and man based on that first lie back in 1947. Do you see the significance of what can happen once we get people to understand those aren't laws and we don't have to follow them? Ohio can be abortion free. Prayer can be back in our schools. Bible reading can be back in our schools. Very simple. Yes, sir. Where is the right to privacy in the Constitution? Made up. Penumbras, they said, right? It's in the penumbras. Well, it's emanations of a penumbra. Okay, okay. All right. Help us out. It wasn't just in the penumbras, right? No. You have to get the emanations. You have to get the emanations of the penumbras. So we live, in a, we live in unbelievably exciting times. We know this. Folks, listen. This is so critical. I've yelled a lot. I want you to understand this. Please understand, don't miss this what I'm about to say right now. No one can serve two masters. Jesus said that. Many of our politicians claim to be Christians. They claim Christ, but they don't obey Christ. Amen. Jesus said... You're either for me or you are against me. You either gather 